Okay. So I'm really, I'm so touched that people came because, um, you know, people said to me, are you scared of reading? I said, I'm not scared of reading. I'm scared no one's going to turn up. <laughs> so really, thank you. Thank you for that. And I'll read a little excerpt, and then um, I would love to have a little discussion with people. If you have any questions about the process of writing, about memoir, about the story itself, about anything, I think it would be great. Because one of the ideas, too, is to have an interactive relationship with readers and writers. So um, some of you I know have already read the book and you've sent me absolutely beautiful feedback that has been really meaningful to me. So I'll just very briefly say, I'm going to read, um, there are seven children in my family and I'm the typical middle child, the one with the big mouth. <laughs> and um, we, uh, from the age of seven, we started moving and I didn't know why my father was in trouble and we just kept moving. My parents would either say we were going on vacation or they would say nothing. And then we would arrive in one place and we would be living there and there would never be any discussion. So by the time this excerpt starts, um, we, we traveled from, New I was born in New York, uh, so we traveled from New York to Mexico, then to Nassau in the Bahamas, then to two different cities in Florida. Then we were finally back in New York where I really felt I belonged. And then a year later, my parents said we were going on vacation to Scotland. So this is the excerpt I'm going to read. And the name of this uh, chapter is called Achai the New. If any of you have been to Scotland, you might know what that means. On our way from the airport to Ayr in Scotland, where we were to spend our vacation, the taxi driver stopped the car at the top of a hill and told us to look below. Och, isn't it bonny, he said. And even though I didn't understand what he'd said, I knew he meant for us to admire his country. I looked down at the gray dampness and thought how ugly it was. The sky was so low, it seemed indistinguishable from the stark hills of the Scottish lowlands. At my feet lay rows of stone houses and rain-streaked roads. Bright purple sprigs of heather provided the only relief from the unremitting dreariness. That's our national flower, said the driver. Are we there yet, I asked, shuddering with cold. The driver laughed. Aye, we lassie, you'll nae be laying him. What? He chuckled. You'll know soon enough. On the airplane, my mother had browsed a brochure on which were illustrated yellow-haired men and women dressed in blue coats, smiling against the background of sun and sea. This is where we're going, she said. It's called Dougal's Holiday Camp. What's a holiday camp, Vic had yawned. It's a place where families stay on vacation. My mother's voice was quick, high, cheerful, like a balloon let off in the air. They have a swimming pool, a dance hall, oh, all kinds of things. It's organized so you know what you're doing. Why do we need people to organize us, I asked. <laughs> Don't start that again, she answered crossly. Is there a roller coaster, asked Rock. Puckering her lips, my mother opened her compact. Stop being so spoiled. Dougal's turned out to be the exact opposite of what the brochure had promised. Built like a small town, streets divided chalets in neat lines, much like a prison camp. Loudspeakers were placed strategically throughout the area, and every morning a bugle would go off, followed by a gleeful, good morning, campers, our signal that sleep was now verboten. Struggling out of bed in the cold damp of the small one-room cottages, I stuffed my body into jeans and headed with the crowds toward the huge mess hall. We stood in lines clutching tin trays with hundreds of others and were doled out rubbery scrambled eggs and little sausages, cornflakes, and a cup of tea. <clears throat> Glancing secretly at my mother before moving to the sugar bowl, I scooped large tablespoonfuls onto everything. One half hour was allowed for breakfast, enough time to get into a fight or watch my parents' blank faces with puzzlement. Then we were off to group activities, swimming, calisthenics, bingo, or sing-alongs. The activities were the camp's attempt to make people forget their troubles. At least, that's what the brochure had said, spelling trouble with a capital T. It reminded me of a joke my father used to tell. There were two brothers, trouble and shut up. One day, they were playing hide and seek, and shut up couldn't find trouble anywhere. He saw a policeman and asked, hey, have you seen my brother? Why, what's your name, little boy? Shut up, he answered. The policeman shook his fist. Are you looking for trouble? Yeah, how did you know, said shut up. <laughs> but there hadn't been any jokes for a while or having to laugh when it wasn't funny. 
Natalie and I snuck away as often as we could to steal chocolate and smoke cigarettes, getting into trouble of our own. I couldn't understand what anyone said, but it didn't matter. We found some cans of beer at the back of the mess hall and got so drunk we didn't care if we could understand anyone or not. Then we got hold of a tube of glue and tried to get high in the bathroom, which was a row of stone stalls, cold and gloomy. Maybe we didn't hold the paper bag correctly, but after rolling around for a few minutes pretending to be stoned, we gave up and went back to roaming between the chalets. The people at the camp had cheeks rubbed raw by the wind, watery, red-rimmed eyes, sta sandy hair that was singularly straight and often stringy, and short, stubby noses. Everyone spoke English, however unintelligible, giving the impression we had something in common. But it was an illusion, and I must have seemed as foreign to them as they seemed to me. To me. It was as if none of us knew where to place one another. The air was laced with an iciness blown in fresh from the Atlantic, but everyone wore bathing suits because it was summer. No doubt on June 21st, the loudspeakers had blared an order for everyone to take off their clothes. A beefy orange-haired man, also there on vacation, offered to take Natalie and me into town in a taxi. He sat in the back between us and put his arm around me so his hand cut my breast. I squeezed my arm tightly against my side to make him move it, but he only gripped harder. When we got back to our cottage, I sat on the windowsill and cried. He made me feel dirty and ugly, and I wanted to go back home. A man carrying a briefcase came to visit us one day while we were in one of the chalets fighting over Scrabble. Hello, my name's M Mr. Mackenzie, he boomed cheerfully. Is your father here? I'll get him, said Kirk officiously. What do you want to see him about, I asked. Mr. Mackenzie laughed, showing uneven, tea-stained teeth beneath his mustache. He's going to be working with me. Didn't he tell you? He's going to help me market scotch. I sponsored him so he could work here. He pulled out a pipe and stuffed it with small sm excuse me, strong-smelling tobacco. He's a smart man, your father. I'm lucky he wanted to come all this way. Lucky, echoed Natalie, looking out the window at the fog blowing in from the sea. How long have you known him, I asked, trying to keep the curiosity from my voice. Mr. Mackenzie smiled broadly. I must have met him when some of you were just a twinkling in your mother's eye. He stroked his jaw thoughtfully. It's the funniest thing. I was sure his name was Ring, but all these years I had the spelling wrong. Why, what is it, asked Fig, quick, asked Fig quickly. Natalie looked at him, warning him to be quiet. Why, you look old enough to know your own last name, laddie. It's Rung, Master Rung. What's your first name? But then my father came in smiling, hand outstretched. The slant of his tie showed he had dressed quickly. As always, a handkerchief sat upright in the breast pocket of his jacket. Hello, I see you've met my children. Come this way. I know a place where we can talk. When they had gone, Kirk pulled his eyebrows in vexation. I thought he said we were here on vacation. Ava inhaled sharply. We'd better be here on vacation. Natalie clutched her hands, a look of fear sweeping across her face. Of course we are. They would have told us by now if we had to stay. Ava frowned. You'd better be right. As my parents had promised, we did stay at Dougal's for three weeks, and I counted off the days on my fingers. When it was time to leave, my father took us for a drive to nearby Glasgow, a city 25 miles from the coast. Bulbous black clouds, refusing to either pour rain or go away, hung dismally in the sky as we turned into a street lined with houses. After pulling into a gray pebble driveway, my father said, welcome to your new home, kids. I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach. But why do we have to move again, I asked feebly, as my mother walked to the front door with a key in hand. I knew it. Ava burst into tears and jumped out of the car. Paralyzed, Natalie stared blankly at the house. My father said calmly, it's for your own welfare. You know as well as I do how bad things have been getting in the States, the schools. He gestured toward Ava. The Vietnam War, he nodded at my brothers. My arms felt lifeless as I unpacked my case. Numbly, I sat on the floor of my new bedroom and paged through my autograph album squeezed into the bottom, unfolding the triangles of colored paper to read what my friends had left for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know what? 
In my nervousness, I forgot I was going to start with the book trailer. Can I show it to you now? Yeah. Yeah. All right. My family traveled the world. It was the 1960s, the jet age. We moved from New York to Mexico, Nassau, Florida, Scotland, London. My father's business took us places we'd never heard of. But our reality was anything but glamorous. We left without warning, without explanation. My father had secrets. My mother kept them. And we suffered the consequences. Cocktails, gangsters, betrayal, rebellion. It sounds like a movie script. But this is the story of my life. It was the opposite of Hollywood. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'd actually like to introduce the producer. Um, is, where's Audrey? Audrey is an incredible video maker and photographer. We'll chat with her after. Um, okay, so does anyone have any questions? How old were you during, during this period? Years, 11 and a half. And your family camp? Oh, yeah. Has anyone been to Butlin's holiday camp? <laughs> Don't go. <laughs> it is the most depressing place. If you're a foreigner, I have to say, because I think for, for working class families in Britain, I don't even know if they exist anymore, but this was a very affordable way for working class families to have a vacation. Oh, you, you know it, Elaine. They do still exist. They, do still, still, London, but they, they, they still exist, okay. And they're really, uh, they're, they're, everything's organized. So it's, there's this feeling of if you want everything to be organized for you, that's great. And probably anybody who's gone to summer camp as kids, you'll get the idea. Except you're in a place where it rains most of the time. So it's, and we had just moved, New York, it was, uh, it was in August and it was 103 degrees. And for kids, that's really nice. You're outside all the time playing. And in New York, they had those sprinklers in the playground and it was all very, you know, homey. And then we went there and it was, you know, the rain was, was falling sideways because it was so windy. And it was probably about 40 or 50 degrees. So it was, it was really difficult. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was like a prison camp. Okay. How much did it help to have a large sibling group? With all this? Oh, yeah, yeah. The question was, um, how hard? How, hard? How, how, much did how much did it help to have, have a lot of a ready-made family? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was, uh, I wouldn't be here as I am today without having a lot of people as a buffer zone. Unfortunately, my parents did this thing of divide and conquer. So they really pitted us against each other and they would try to get us to tell on each other. You know, so that, it, that on that side of it, it's not good. But in terms of not just being the only child of my parents, it saved me. Yeah. Hey, Anita. Hey, I have a question in, the, in that beautiful film, by the way, or the trailer, were, and I'm wondering if any family members had reactions to the memory. Let me just say, the silence is deafening. <laughs> Although I finally, I talked with Audrey about this, putting it on Facebook. I was so nervous because one brother and one sister, they're on Facebook. And I was just really scared. Um, and I was shaking when I decided to do it, you know, several weeks after it was finished. And one brother did write back right away, and he said, brilliant trailer, I love it. And then I said, oh, I know, it was great. So I wrote back, I said, oh, great, let's, let's FaceTime soon. He goes, okay, so you know, we, we finally got to FaceTime. This was just about a week or two ago. And then he and his wife had just sat down to watch a movie, and they kept looking at the TV. And I'm like, okay, I should not have said, let's follow up on this. <laughs> but I was really pleased with the reaction, yeah. Okay. Um, well, first of 
first of all, thank you for this book. It's really fantastic. Your life is beautiful, and it's, it's such a very powerful book. I hope everybody reads it. Um, thank you. And my question really is about, because it's so vivid, did you keep journals as a kid, or um, were, were there letters that you had, or how did you reconstruct some of those scenes that are so vivid in your mind? Did you hear the question? Yeah, okay, good. Um, you know, I was so confused when I grew up that I didn't know what was happening. I was just in a place of reaction to what was happening. And I didn't understand why my memories were so strong, so clear, because I have a sister who doesn't remember anything. And then I read this book called The Body Keeps the Score, that I know Karen has that, which is an amazing book about PTSD. And then he said the memory can work a couple of different ways when you've been traumatized. One is that you forget everything. You just blank it out. And the other is that your memories become frozen. And for people who have not been through trauma or you're not remembering things that have a traumatic uh, flair, <laughs> shall I say to them, or you know, where you suffer trauma, we are constantly re, re um, we're, What's the word? Reshaping memories. But when you've been traumatized, they're, they can just be frozen. And I see Pearl shaking, yeah, nodding her head there, yeah. So what I did in order to, the reason I wrote the book is because I wanted to know what happened. So I wrote down everything I could remember. And then I shaped it. And I left a lot of stuff out. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Tam. My family's so afraid. Yeah, they're really afraid because we grew up with such fear and secrecy that occasionally, we don't really get together, but occasionally the times that we have gotten together as adults, somebody might say something and somebody else will say something and kind of make a joke of it. But if you try to continue that conversation, it doesn't go anywhere, you know. Um, Kind of outside the boundary of the book, but so many of your family aren't like talented. Don't use their real names. Yeah. Yeah. Musicians and writers in your family. Yeah. Famous and as you are, you know, how did this growing up? Yeah, how, uh, there are several siblings in my family who are very talented artists. There are two very, very, I mean, I think they're brilliant composer, music, musical composers and musicians. And then one uh, sister is an incredible artist. Another brother writes poetry. Uh, another sister taught herself the flute, but she, and she's a great photographer, but she hasn't really pursued it. So many of us in the family are artists. So the question was, how did that happen? Was that the question? I mean, you grew up so spiteful. Yeah. You know, I mean, you guys didn't have a lot of tools. Yeah. Like that felt shape. Yeah. I mean, for me, definitely, because I wanted to find out what the truth was. I think my brother. I I can't really explain it. It's like a sixty-four thousand dollar question. I think that people who are really abused can find their solace through art. I guess that's all I would say. Yeah. Your parents did give you music lessons. Yeah, when we were in New York, we, we had piano lessons when we were the normal middle class family. Yeah. And then again, when we moved to London, we had piano lessons. Yeah. I just want to ask also are your parents still alive? No. My mother died in 2002. And my father, we found out, he basically stopped, he disappeared to all of us one by one. And um, we found out in 2007 that he had died in 2004. Um, he kept traveling and doing whatever he did. And he was caught by Interpol. And he was taken back to New York from Britain. And he was supposed to go to prison for 20 years. And he came back a month later. And then later on a visit to New York, he had all the bones in his face broken. And another time he came back with black thumbs. So I don't know what he did, 
but something happened for him to not go to prison. I know he was in jail several times, but he didn't have to serve that sentence. Yeah. Did you ever find out what he did? Well, I got his FBI file, and most of it was blacked out. But what they did keep in there were his mafia connections. And another thing I saw, which I never knew, in Scotland, the whiskey business that he was in, first of all, when we moved to London, he had an office. And there were lots of doors in the office. And they said president, vice president, CEO, you know. And there was nothing behind, they, they were just doors, <laughs> you know. And then in the FBI file, I saw that the warehouse, he got people to invest in Scotch whiskey that didn't exist. That's what he did in Britain. That's what I found out from the FBI file. And the warehouse had no, no whiskey in it. Yeah. Yeah. As one of my students told me from the juvenile jail, your father was, he did the long con. And the long con is where you are kind of the front person. You get the people suckered in. And then you have the people behind you, you know. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, Rebecca and then Delilah. How do you come out? Right now? <laughs> you know, it's funny. Yeah, I mean, I thought I would feel really, uh, I knew I needed it in my hand to externalize the story. And I wanted to share it with other people because when I was young, I would have loved a book like that to help me. But what happened after publishing it, I've actually been very spaced out. And I don't quite know why, but I think I got kind of almost re-traumatized in a way. Because, you know, when I was young, I felt like I was floating in space all the time. As a teacher, though, when you're teaching writing and people have the sense of expressions and the trauma for being in jail as a psychiatrist or philosopher or whatever you are, how do you explain that? Explain what? Just that, you know, I would think that after you write, you feel relieved, you feel sex, or anything else, but if you feel relieved, you found it out. You know what would be really great if that was the end of the story? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm very proud of the fact that I did it. I really am proud of that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but unfortunately, you know, it, probably everybody in this room has had really rough times. And the problem is, is that, you know, they affect you for the rest of your life. And you try to find ways to to deal with that, you know. Uh, hi. Um, Thank you. Um, and I guess I know that, you know, your process with your growth fits and then it got sort of thrown in that corner for a long time, right? Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, is it, is it changed very much for you during that time? Or is it kind of essentially the same story that you started with or coming back to it? Well, the story itself is the same, but the way I shaped it, the way I, I think I became a much better writer in that time. And I also decided, because I first wrote it as a novel, then I changed it into a memoir, and that's when it almost got published. And then when I went back to it, I decided to write it as an autobiographical novel, because um, I realized now it gave me the, I changed my name, my name is Tosca in it, and I, it gave me the distance I needed. So I had, I had processed a lot more of what happened to me by then. Yeah, thank you. As you were writing it, did you have any epiphanies or moments where you said it, suddenly something from the past made sense to you that hadn't made sense before? Yeah, yeah. In fact, last week uh, something happened. I'm trying to remember what that was. Yeah, uh, well, for those of you who haven't read the book, forget you've heard this, so I don't spoil it. But. <laughs> Um, I started playing the guitar when I was a teenager, and I loved that guitar more than anything. And then um, my sister painted a mural on it, and it meant so much to me. And then uh, we left Glasgow, this is in Glasgow, for London, and my two sisters stayed behind because they were old enough to leave. And then um, shortly after that, we were liter we actually were on vacation. We went to, the Jer to Jersey, which is... Um, the Jersey Islands, and um, I woke up the morning, you know, every morning I'd go to, you know, I'd play it, I'd, it was really my friend, and then I'd wake up in the morning and I'd see it the first thing, and then when I went to bed tonight, last thing I looked at, and then the last morning we were there in the hotel, I woke up and the guitar was gone, and um, 
I, you know, ran to where my parents were sleeping. It's like, you know, my guitar has been stolen. And my father's, you know, you know, they were very annoyed. And then I said, you have to tell the police, tell the police. So my father sort of made this pretense that he was telling the police. And then two years later, it was never found. And two years later, my brother told me my father had seen him that morning and said, Margo's going to get a big shock when she wakes up. So I was actually thinking that this week or last week, it's like, what, what, what kind of person can do that to somebody? Because, you know, as, if you've been through trauma, there are so many layers of it. And it took me so long. To, and the, writing this book had a lot to do with me being able to see what happened to me and process it. But there are so many layers. You know, so I'm probably going to, you know, be realizing things. I mean, I think we all kind of go through that, you know. What's your relationship now with any of the places you live with well, I took my partner back to Scotland, and we both got really depressed. <laughs> um, I didn't, when I, I moved here in 1986 from London, and then I went back a year and a half later, and then I didn't go back for 11 years, because it was just too painful to kind of try to make a new life and have that old life. Then I started going back every couple of years or so, but the last time I went, I don't know, I just felt that I didn't really, it's really difficult. Actually, I want to mention Karen Apana, who's an incredible, incredible person, artist and body worker and healer. And when we were talking about this, um, Karen said, you know, when, you're, when you live in a place, you're part of a web of relationships. When you leave, that web is configured differently. And when you come back, you're not part of that web anymore. And it was really painful for me to see that. So I haven't been for about three years now. And the other places, I've been to Mexico several times, and that was really meaningful. I actually didn't believe I had lived in Mexico until I went back to Cuernavaca. And I saw the school where I went. And then I know, wow, this is your, because my parents never talked about it, you know. Um, I've never been back to Florida. I, I would like to go. New York, yeah, I've been back several times. And then, yeah, that's it. Did you have any trepidation about writing the book, considering your dad was a part of the mafia? Like, did you think there was going to be any backlash from it? Yeah, I woke up every night at three, scared he was going to kill me. You know? Yeah. Thank God he's dead. <laughs> you know, I once heard of the, the man who directed, I think his name was Jim Harrison, he directed the Magdalene Sisters. And he was um, interviewed by Terry Gross on Fresh Air. And he said the day his mother or his father died was the best day of his life. And I thought, wow, that's not my kind of person. <laughs> but Terry Gross could not go near it. You know? But unfortunately, you know, not all of us have good parents. You know? Did you have any epiphanies about why people, why did they have seven kids if they were so happy with their kids and they dragged you all around? Like, they just said you well, yeah. Well, did you hear the question? Why did they have so many kids? Um, first of all, we weren't allowed to know our relatives. Okay. Um, the other thing is that irresponsible people have children, right? And I think it might have been a cover to make them look like normal people. Also, my mother said my father liked her most when she was pregnant. They didn't obviously didn't like birth control. That's the only answers I can come up with, because it's kind of a mystery to me. Because people like us, we wouldn't do that unless we could take care of them, right? Was there any love in your family between your parents or your um, There was a lot of love, I think, between the siblings. We weren't always good at expressing it, but I think it was there. I don't think that my parents loved us. I don't know if they loved each other. They were very loyal to each other, but my father was a criminal, my mother was his accomplice. So there might have been some other dynamic going there. When I told my mother I was a lesbian, she said, if I was your age, I would be doing the same thing. Sex with men is an act of violence. And I thought, oh, well. <laughs> I guess this is one time I don't want to ask any questions. <laughs> yeah? Um, well, as they lied about everything, I found out after they died, my mother was 
um, 23, and my father was 26. Yeah. New York, New York City. Their parents were, I didn't know this either until they died, but the myth was that we were French and Russian on my father's side, wasps, like, I, like, I, like Protestant, French, whatever, Russian, whatever. And then on my, oh no, one time my father said he thought his mother was Catholic. The other side, my mother said her father was um, an English parson and her mother was an Italian opera singer. <laughs> And it turned out that my mother's parents were Hungarian Jews who were not allowed into this country in the beginning. They had to go to Argentina for two years, then try again through Ellis Island. And they came here three years before she was born. So very recent immigrants. And my father's parents were Russian immigrants. And one of his brothers was actually born in Russia. Yeah. Um, have you ever tried to have yeah, that's a really good question. Honestly, on a bad day, in a bad situation with one of my siblings, I think, you're just like my father, you're just like my mother. So um, I think that my partner actually got my mother out of me. <laughs> because you know when you're kids, you sort of mimic your parents' behavior, and I, was, I did have this habit of being very cold sometimes, you know? So I think that when you're around good people, they, you get socialized out of that kind of behavior. But I tried really, really hard to find my mother's sisters. My mother was an orphan, I found out. And she and her sisters were suddenly taken away from school. It's a whole other story. And it's actually in um, my anthology, How I Learned to Cook. I wrote a story about my mother. But um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get my train of thought here. Oh, yeah. So I tried really hard to find my mother's family. And I couldn't find them because she gave a fake maiden name. So. Out of the blue, in 2009, I think it was. No, it was 2011. Out of the blue, the the, I got an email. Are you Margot Perrin, the daughter of Lillian Perrin? So I, she goes, if you are, call me. I called her right away, and it was my mother's sister. And I thought, wow, you know, wow, I finally found, you know, she found me. And she was living in Las Vegas. She was a big gambler. <laughs> But I went to visit her, like within two weeks I was there to visit her. And she looked actually a lot like me, which was interesting. And she, she had sort of the same body type as my mother. And she was very nice. She and her husband were so nice to me. But by my third visit, she said, don't come anymore. So she was a bit like my mother. And I met her kids, and when they visited her, when I was there, she was very cold to them. I think they just had such a horrible childhood. They never got over it. My father's family, um, when my sister moved back to New York in uh, 1981, she wrote a letter to the New York Times about some article that they published. And they published her letter. And um, my aunt saw, my father's sister-in-law saw the letter with her name and contacted her through the paper. And that's how we met my father's side of the family. Yeah. And they were not like my father. They were not. One of my uncles said that your father wanted to be, your father could have been rich in 10 years, he wanted to be rich in one. Yeah. What time is it now? Okay, any other? How did your father be a communist? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my father was a, he was in the Navy when he was young. And he um, joined the Communist Party. And he was a very, very avid communist, very idealistic. And um, in 1950, when my oldest sister was three months old, he and my mother sold everything and tried to move to Russia. And they tried to get in through um, Finland. And they weren't, they weren't allowed in. They were accused of being American spies, because it was right in the middle of the Cold War. So they tried again from 
Czechoslovakia, and they were refused again. Then they were kept in a hotel for a month under house arrest, and then they were deported to England. And then from England, my father's brother sent money for them to get back to New York. And then I think he was just so disillusioned, you know, that was it. That was it. I mean, it was really interesting because I sort of grew up with left-wing politics, but at the same time, my father was this very capitalistic, do anything for money type of person. It was pretty confusing. You have you heard OPM, other people's money? <laughs> so it was up or down, up or down, up or down. Yeah. Yeah. You never were like. No, 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 we would just leave town. I mean, seriously, because my father didn't want anyone, any of the authorities to know about where his, his whereabouts. My brother was hit by a car when we lived in Florida, and my father didn't have enough money to pay for his treatment, but somebody helped him out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm actually working on a book that's um, it's part narrative poetry and part prose. And what I do is I weave my childhood story, not the story, but the, sort of the themes of the story with how the experience uh, played out through my body. I've had a lot of physical illness and also interweaving it with my experiences teaching people who are incarcerated because there was a lot of crossover. Yeah. How many years were you nomadic? Uh, started when I was four and ended, when I left home when I was 16. Oh, oh, how long were we nomadic? Yeah, yeah. Um, first, thank you for the inspiration, it's amazing. Uh, and secondly, um, I, I think it's a comment more than a question, but that when you, it seems that you've made a very personal story, but the way you crafted it is so universal. I mean, when when your mom says, "Don't start that again," like who hasn't heard that? You know, and are we there yet? You know, it's like you really, you really. I can't wait to read it, and it feels like you've really connected your yourself and your soul with the reader. Thank you. I mean, I feel like as a writer, what I've learned, and also as a writing teacher, what I try to teach is. The, the, the deeper you write, the more universal your story. Like for example, I mean, I think you heard me say this another time, but if you just write a story about, from the point of view of a victim, you know, all these horrible things happened to me and I'm really suffering, you're not really telling the whole story. You're not going deep enough, because there's always the other side. So you want to write deeply and broadly, and then you'll get to those universals, you know. And I noticed when um, I published a book of, of um, by, of writing by people who were incarcerated. And when they got out of jail, we used to do readings all over the city. And Joan actually, lovely Joan, hosted one of them at the Caret Auditorium right over there. And um, it was really amazing because people would come from very different social, socioeconomic classes, class. And they would say to the writers afterwards, I had no idea I had anything in common with you because the way they were writing was deep enough. And telling the story, you know. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you.